my, uh, my great pleasure to uh, introduce the, uh, Ludwig von Mises Memorial Lecture, sponsored by Yusuf al Mawayed, who is here with us today. Um, our speaker, Mike, Michael Rechtenwald, is a retired professor, is a, is a professor of liberal studies at New York University, where he taught cultural and social history, as well as academic writing, um, since 2008. He is the author of eight books, including Springtime for Snowflakes, Social Justice, and its Postmodern Parentage, which I just finished reading and I highly recommend, and we have copies of. 19th Century British Secularism, Science, Religion, and Literature, Academic Writing, Real World Topics, and Social Secularisms in a Post-Secular Age. His academic essays have appeared in the British Journal for the History of Science, Endeavor, and the Cambridge University Press Anthology, George Eliot in Context, among others. Dr. Recton Wall is a prominent spokesperson for academic freedom and free speech, and an expert on the history and character of the social justice movement. He has published articles and essays on these topics in several periodicals and news outlets, and has appeared regularly on national television as well as on numerous radio and internet shows. He holds a PhD in literary and cultural studies from Carnegie Mellon University, a master's in English literature from Case Western Reserve University, and a BA in English literature from the University of Pittsburgh. The topic of the lecture today is libertarianisms versus postmodernism and social justice ideology. Dr. Rechtenwald. Thank you very much, Joe, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Institute for having me here at this very venerable institution. And, uh, and I'd like to thank Pat, Pat for uh, making everything possible for me here. And uh, so my title is Libertarianisms versus Postmodernism and Social Justice Ideology. As, as is usual, I veered a little bit away from the topic slightly. Uh, and when I said libertarianisms, I'm speaking of not the various schools, but basically, you know, civil, cultural, and economic libertarianism. Not <clears throat> any particular schools within it. And uh, what what is uh, post? How 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 they conflict? How it conflicts with uh, postmodern theory and social justice ideologies? If you've read my book, Springtime for Snowflakes, uh, there'll there'll be a few passages that'll sound somewhat familiar. Hopefully, <laughs> that is if you, um, but. Most of this is entirely new. I'm going to be talking about social justice, not in the university or the academy, actually, but in the corporate world. So a peculiar phrase recently introduced into the political lexicon by Media Cognoscenti describes a new corporate philosophy, woke capitalism. Coined by Ross Duthot of the New York Times, woke capitalism refers to a burgeoning wave of companies that have apparently become advocates of social justice. Some major corporations now intervene in social and political issues and controversies, partaking in a new corporate activism. The newly woke corporations support activist groups and social movements while adding their voices to political debates. Woke capitalism has endorsed Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, contemporary feminism, LGBTQ rights, immigration activism, among other causes. How can we understand woke capitalism? What is it? Is it effective, and if so, why? Meanwhile, what is now meant by social justice? And is it a good, is it a good thing? As it turns out, analyzing woke capitalism will tell us a great deal about contemporary corporate capitalism, the contemporary political left, and the relationship between the two. It also recall, recalls an earlier corporate leftism, as I'll discuss later. Woke capitalism helps us to make sense of the topic of my next book, yes, hip promotion, shameless, uh, Google Archipelago. <laughs> Titles are, my, are getting to be my thing. Which is the study of big digital, uh, the mega data services, media, cable, and internet services, social media platforms, artificial intelligent agents, apps, and the develop, developing internet of things. The scary thing about the global of uh, Google archipelago is not merely that it is this huge amalgam of digital business interests, 
but that it operates as what Michel Foucault, one of the few, if not only redeemable, of postmodern theorists, called a governmentality, a means of governing the, contact, the conduct of populations, but also the technologies of governance and the rationality that underpins those technologies. So <clears throat> as for social justice, some what we call a 20th century social justice movements. The civil rights movement comes to mind. But due to the influence of postmodern theoretical ideas and Soviet and Sino-Communist disciplinary techniques, social justice has taken on new distinct features. Whereas the free speech, the campus free speech movement was the hallmark or a hallmark of social justice in the 1960s, violent skirmishes waged against free speech and ac academic freedom are now associated with the term. Events that have unfolded on college campuses such as Yale, New York University, UC Berkeley, Mid Middlebury College, Evergreen State College, and many others bear the social justice insignia. Among other postmodern theoretical notions, the contemporary social justice creed dr draws on what is called social and linguistic constructivism, which is an epistemological premise derived from the postmodern theory that holds, holds that language constitutes an, um, often uh, social and often all of reality, rather than merely attempting to represent it or some other theory of language. Under social and linguistic constructivism, Language is considered a material agent. Its uses as tantamount to physical acts. This belief explains the term discursive violence. For the social justice believer, language can enact violence by itself without any attendant actions. Today's social justice creed is marked by preoccupations with new identities and their politics. It entails a broad palette of beliefs and practices represented by concerns and shibboleths, including privilege, white privilege, privilege checking, self-criticism or auto-critique, cultural appropriation, intersectionality, discursive violence, microaggressions, mansplaining, manspreading, and many others. Excuse me. The terms multiply almost as rapidly as the gender identities. <laughs> Self-criticism and privilege checking are the vestiges of auto-critique and struggle sessions, purification methods of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. In the late 1960s, as word spread from the communist revival to the West through student and feminist movements of Europe, especially France, the birthplace of most postmodern theory, they became part of the, West's, the Western left's vocabulary and toolkit and have not left. In struggle sessions, the guilty party, accused of selfishness, ignorance, and the embrace of bourgeois ideology, was pilloried with verbal and often physical assaults by her comrades until she broke down and confessed her characterological and ideological flaws. Today, the confessions involve privileged or the unearned advantage enjoyed by members of the dominant group based on appearance. Usually on demand, checking one's privilege means to acknowledge unearned advantage and to atone for it publicly. Meanwhile, in the Chinese Cultural Revolution, auto-critique began with the guilty party, who subjected herself to verbal uh, self-inspection and denigration before the jury of her comrades. By the way, I'm using the feminine here because it was often, it often was a lot of women because it was a lot of teachers who were exposed to this. Um, auto-critique and struggle sessions could lead to imprisonment or death as the comrade was often or are almost always found to be insufficiently pure. In self-criticism or self-crit or call-out routines today, which are soft forms of uh, auto-critique and struggle sessions, uh, they have become prevalent on the internet. They came, became prevalent on the internet sometime after 2009. They then infiltrated universities and other social spaces. <clears throat> Intersectionality is the axiomatic oppression ranking framework that establishes a new social justice hierarchy based on the multiplicities of oppression as they may intersect and affect subjects in multiple supposedly subordinated social categories. 
It is no less than a scale for weighing oppression. It then inverts the supposed existing hierarchy on the basis of this intersexual, intersectional oppression ranking, moving those on the bottom to the top and vice versa. This is not a temporary feature of social justice, but represents a hierarchical inversion that must be maintained to engender the animus and resentment necessary to continue fueling the movement. Uh, this ranking system began in Soviet circles, Soviet theory, uh, with the uh, Hungarian and Soviet, Soviet literary critic and Marxist philosopher, uh, George Lukács. In his book, History and Class Consciousness, 1923, Lukács introduced a form of epistemology that has had an outsized impact ever since, serving as a source for postmodern theory and social justice. The social justice notion that each person has their own truth based on their own type of subordination can be traced directly to Lukács. He argued that the unique position of the working class within the social order and the relations of production provided the proletariat with a privileged vantage point for discerning objective reality and called the theory proletarian standpoint epistemology. Lukács argued that reality under capitalism is a single objective reality. That, that now is a very scary, you can't say that anymore. But the proletarian has a peculiar relationship to objective reality. The objective world strikes the proletarian differently than it does the capitalist. Like the capitalist, the proletarian is a self-conscious subject. However, unlike the capitalist, the proletarian is also a commodity, an object for sale on the market. It is the proletarian's consciousness of the commodification of his selfhood it contradicts his experience as a living subject, a person with subjective experience. The proletariat's self-consciousness of the commodity, that is himself, explains the working class's antagonism towards capitalism as Lukács saw it. While the proletarian fully grasps the contradiction of his self-conscious commodification, the class can only come to terms with the contradiction by upending and abolishing existing conditions, as, of course, we know happened in a way. Feminists and postmodern theorists later appropriated standpoint epistemology and siphoned it through various identity filters. It is the root of the contemporary social justice belief in the connection between identity and knowledge. Social justice holds that membership in a subordinated identity group grants members exclusive access to particular knowledge, their own knowledge. Members of, the, of dominant identity groups especially cannot access or understand the knowledge of the subordinated others. For example, a white cis-hetero male, which is a white straight male who accepts the gender he was assigned at birth. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> cannot have a black lesbian's experience and therefore can't access or understand her knowledge. Individuals within subordinated identity groups also have their own individual knowledge. So for social justice believers, knowledge is ultimately personal, individual, and impenetrable to others. It is my knowledge. I call this notion of knowledge epistemological solipsism. Under the social justice worldview, everyone is locked in an impenetrable identity chrysalis with access to a personal knowledge that no one else can reach. Therefore, social justice ideology does not foster egalitarianism. Rank is maintained, only the bottom becomes the top when the totem pole of identity is inevitably flipped upside down and stood on its head. Is it any wonder then that the social justice warriors compete valiantly for the status of most subordinated in the games derogatorily referred to as the oppression Olympics? <laughs> After all, the race to the bottom is really a race to the top, although the race runs downhill. <laughs> Both its epistemology and ontology, its assumptions about how one acquires knowledge, who can know, and what the nature of the objects of knowledge are, are enforced within authoritarianism. And this is necessarily the case with uh, subjectivism and, idea, uh, and philosophical idealism. Uh, claims made on behalf of correct beliefs, correct wording, proper naming, that is language itself, 
trump empirical evidence and nullify scientific findings and methods in advance. Thus, the social justice uh, rep creed represents an entirely new understanding, quite distinct from previous versions. It also involves an entirely different set of practices and methods for implementing it. The social and linguistic constructivist claims of social justice ideologues amount to a form of philosophical and social idealism that is enforced with a moral absolutism. One's beliefs are unconstrained by the object world, and people can believe anything they like with impunity. The possibility for, for assuming a pretense of infallibility becomes almost irresistible, especially when the requisite power is available to support such a pretense. And we saw that, of course, in the Soviet Union. Lysenkoism was a great example. In fact, given its willy-nilly determination of truth and reality on the basis of beliefs alone, philosophical and social idealism necessarily becomes dogmatic, authoritarian, anti-rational, and effectively religious. Since it sanctions no pushback from the object world and regards it with indifference or disdain, it necessarily encounters pushback from the object world and must double down. Because it usually contains so much nonsense, the social and philosophical idealism of the social justice creed must be established by force or the threat of force. Excuse me, I'm, I'm just getting dry mouth here. Uh, I have something for that. <laughs> and here we go. Today. I will discuss some contemporary manifestations of social justice, but not as it plays out in the academy, a topic that I have treated in my recent most book, Springtime for Snowflakes, which is downstairs in the bookstore. <laughs> Instead, my topic today is, social, is the social justice of US for-profit corporations. Although regarded as new, I will show that woke capitalism is but a subset and recent type of a broader and longer standing corporate ethos that I call corporate leftism. As it turns out, analyzing contemporary, poli the, uh, the contemporary political left and the relationship between uh, corporate capitalism uh, will give us a great deal of information. Woke capitalism helps to make sense of the topic of my next book, Google Archipelago. Despite the backlash, Nike's ad campaign featuring Colin Kaepernick with whose national anthem kneel downs brought Black Lives Matter pro uh, protests to the NFL dramatically boosted Nike's sales. The ad's success supported business insider columnist Josh Barrow's theory that woke capitalism provides a form of parapolitical representation for, uh, for corporate consumers. Given their perceived political disenfranchisement in the political sphere, Woke capitalism offers representation in, pu in the public sphere. With wokeness, do thought of the Times argues, corporations offer workers and customers rhetorical placebos in lieu of co costlier economic concessions, such as higher wages, better benefits, or lower prices. Short of a socialist revolution, New York uh, Congressional Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's Green New Deal seems unlikely to materialize. Do thought suggest that woke capitalism works by substituting symbolic for economic value? And these same gestures of wokeness <clears throat> may also appeal and appease, appeal to and appease the liberal political elite, promoting their agendas of identity politics, gender pluralism, transgenderism, lax immigration standards, sanctuary cities, and so on. In return, the woke corporation hopes to be spared higher taxes, increased regulations, and antitrust legislation aimed at monopolies. This, this is not my theory. This is due thoughts theory. <clears throat> Meanwhile, and now here's a reading, my, my reading of one of the ads of woke capitalism. At least one woke capital, capitalist corporation appears intent on scolding its customers. I refer to Gillette and its We Believe ad. Like Nike, Gillette is a subsidiary of Procter & Gamble. First posted to its social media accounts in mid-January 2019, and then the ad condescendingly lectures men, presumably cis-hetero men, about toxic masculinity. In the provocative ad, three men look into separate mirrors, but not to shave, but rather to examine themselves for tra traces of the dreaded condition. 
voiceovers admonish men to say the right thing, to act the right way, quote unquote. Dramatizations of bullying, mansplaining, misogyny, and sexual predation shame bad men and enjoy a woke minority of men to hold other men accountable or, or else fakes shame as well. <clears throat> For Gillette, shaving now apparently means shearing away the characteristics associated with manhood now deemed pathological by the American Psychological Association. To prevent the sudden onset or relapse of man disease, <laughs> self-groomers must ex exercise vigilance, scathing self-scrutiny, and unwavering determination. Even though their gender malignance has been socially constructed, men are responsible for immediately discerning and excising its outgrowth. The Gillette ad thus prescribes a new gender hygienics by which such brutes can move upward, working out the beast, to quote, uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson, yeah. becoming the best a man can get it, quote unquote, a newly shorn animal, or rather a new kind of man shorn of animality. Like the Nike Kaepernick ad, the Gillette We Believe ad provoked significant bat backlash, but parent company and Procter & Gamble's executive response to the ensuing furor suggested that the corporation was willing to forego profits for virtue points, at least for now. John Muller, Procter & Gamble's CFO, told reporters that post-ad sales were, quote, in line with pre-campaign levels, end quote. Uh, in advertising words, uh, terms, in other words, the ad was a failure. <laughs> <laughs> Yet M Muller viewed the expenditure as an investment in the future. Quote, it's part of our effort to connect more meaningfully with younger consumer groups, he explained, perhaps referring to those too young to sport the toxic stubble. <laughs> I remained unsatisfied with the above explanations. I still wondered why and how corporations assumed the role of social justice arbiters, and how and why social justice came to be an ideology of the U.S. corporation. But before venturing my own theory, however, I'd like to retrace a history of corporate leftism, which will shed light on the relationship between leftism and corporatism. Corporate leftism has a long history dating at least to the late 19th century and early 20th centuries. I first recognized the cor corporate leftism through the histories that documented the funding of the Russian and other socialist revolutions by leading US capitalists and bankers. As Richard Spence boldly declares in Wall Street and the Russian Revolution 1905 to 1925, the term socialist capitalist is not an oxym oxymoron. Spence was not referring to so-called mixed economies, but rather to a false dichotomy, a mating of two supposed economic antimonies, socialism and capitalism. Understanding why the term is not an oxymoron does not necessarily depend upon historical knowledge uncovered by Spence and before him, rather sloppily, I should say, by Anthony C. Sutton. Uh, although given that I am an historian, I found this material very revealing. But the apparent contradiction in terms is based on a mischaracterization of economic opposites and a failure to detect in the original name for the field of economics, namely political economy, the inherent possibility of such a conjunction. The real opposites are not capitalism and socialism. They are individual freedom versus centralized political control, whether statist or corporate. <clears throat> According to Sutton's Wall Street and FDR, 1975, corporate socialism is a system where those few who hold the legal minorities of financial and industrial uh, control profit at the expense of all others in society. For Sutton, the most lucid and frank description of corporate socialism and its, and its moors and objectives is to be found in a 1906 booklet by Frederick Clemson Howe entitled Confessions of a Monopolist. In attempting to validate Sutton's reference to Howe, as the prototypical monopolist or even corporate socialist, I was disappointed. But ultimately, I found the excursion rewarding. I began by looking in Spence's Wall Street and the Russian Revolution, which had the same title as one of Sutton's major books, except for the added date range. I searched feverishly for how in Confessions of a Monopolist. Actually, as is my want, I was using electronic text 
and the Kindle version of Spence, so my search produ produced nothing like a fever. I am no I'm nostalgic for a past that I never knew. When in the 19th century, in novels, the researches of fictional characters like Victor Frankenstein resulted in life-threatening frenzies. Uh, call me romantic. <coughs> My problem was that I wanted to introduce corporate leftism and corporate socialism by referring to a television sitcom of the 1970s, namely Gilligan's Island. Some of you will be old enough and will have hailed from backgrounds as plebeian as my own to recall this program. The, sit the situation for this quote-unquote dumb TV show, as Mises scholar B.K. Marcus aptly put it, is a small community of seven, uh, uh, seven American castaways on a deserted island. Because it aired in the 70s, Gilligan's Island is a collectivist Robinson Crusoe tale with a socialist pretext. Each character represents a different life station in an otherwise lost world of individualism cast from a division of labor that is rendered absurd, let alone inapplicable, by the social and eco economic life of desertion. Since the show, show's creator, Sherwood Schwartz, was at least an unconscious Marxist, the, situ the sitcom demonstrated episode after episode that, quote, in a communist society, no one has exclu one exclusive sphere of activity, end quote. Actress, professor, millionaire's wife, and all the rest must, quote, hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner. That's Marx from the German ideology. <laughs> they must outgrow the limited specializations imposed on them by the capitalist order. This goes for everyone on the island, except, it seems, for the monopolist. Thurston B. Howe the Third. Although their names were not identical, they were near homonyms, and I'd hoped to connect Frederick Howe and Thurston B. Howe. They had to be connected. I, I hadn't been so sanguine as, as to expect that Thurston Howe had been directly named after Frederick Howe. After all, their names were spelled differently, yet I hoped for some reference. And they were both monopolists, or thought, so I thought. Uh oh. Spence did not mention Howe as the model monopolist or corporate socialist. In fact, he curiously admitted any reference to Howe's name and his rule book for monopoly. Coming up empty in, in such a cognate publication, I began to feel flush and somewhat panicky. And as you know, you, humanity scholars are susceptible to this kind of hyper-emotionality. <laughs> <coughs> Nor could I find any mention of Frederick Howe in connection with Thurston B. Howe at all. And while a few of the re early reviews of Confessions took the book at face value and came to the same conclusion as Sutton, that it represented the autobiography of a real monopolist giving away his secrets, even the most cursory assessment of Dr. Frederick Howe's life and, uh, and other works would have quickly disabused anyone but the most tendentious polemicist of the idea that Howe's Confessions was a rule book or how-to manual for the monopolists. Howe was nothing like the corporate magnate or mega banker that Sutton suggested he was, and so he could not possibly have helped bankroll the creation of a, quote, captive market and a technical colony to be exploited by a few high-powered American fi financiers and the corporations under their control, end quote, that is, the Soviet Union. First of all, Howe had earned a PhD from John Hopkins University. A real monopolist would wait for an honorary degree. <laughs> <laughs> Further, Confessions of a Monopolist was not even an autobiography. It was a biting satire, a criticism of monopolists and monopolies, written by a progressive reformer and later FDR statesman, who, of course, then knew about monopolies, but he wasn't the the prototypical fictional mon monopolist or monopolist that uh, Sutton had made him out to be. As it turned out, both Howe and Howe had been fic fictional monopolists. Yet the Thurston Howe on Gilligan's Island was certainly something like the stereotypical monopolist described in Frederick Howe's book. Like the character in Confessions, Howe's number one role was, quote, to make society work for you, end quote. Thurston Howe certainly managed to command the labor and deference of his fellow islanders. As Marcus notes in The Monetary Economics of Thurston Howe III, yes, you have a scholar who has written about this here, Howe was able to commandeer labor and goods by virtue of his off 
island status to procure goods and services by writing checks drawn on U.S. banks. The fact that this fiat currency functioned in the absence of the government that backed it suggests that money operates according to a cultural Lamarckian evolutionary process. This is my idea, probably crazy. Money's governmentally enforced fiat characteristic is an acquired characteristic that is passed on, passed along through future generational transactions and retains these characteristics even after its basis and force disappears, at least until it is replaced and sometimes even after that. As Mises showed, the value of a currency is historical and the study of currencies must be historicist. Howe's expressions of monopolistic desiderata, however, are best expressed in episode 9, The Big Gold Strike, when Gilligan, acting as Howe's golf, golf caddy, falls into a giant hole where he notices something golden embedded in the walls of the cave. Naturally, Howe recognizes gold and assumes that it is, is his property. After all, Gilligan was in his, him, his employ, albeit fooled by a faux fiat currency. Howe swears Gilligan to secrecy to secure his ownership against the islanders' agreement that all property on the island would be communal. But soon the mine is discovered by the rest of the community. The unreliability of the state appears to, to, be, uh, to account for Howe's problem in securing exclusive gold mining rights. Gilligan is the nominal and ineffectual president of the island and a buffoon who has no power. But Howe's failure as a monopolist is more fundamental. While he is perfectly capable, capable to, quote, let others work for you, he does not know the language or ways of corporate socialism and does not understand how to establish monopoly within such a state. Rather than continually yielding to expressions of blatant self-interest, a corporate socialist would couch his monopolistic ambitions in the language of equality. Rather than Frederick Howe, King Camp Gillette would have provided a much better model for Thurston Howe. The founder of the American Safety Razor Company in 1901, who changed its name to the Gillette Safety Razor Company in 1902, Gillette published The Human Drift in 1894. While acknowledging that, quote, no reform movement can, movement can meet with success unless that movement takes into consideration the power of capital and is based on present business models and conforms to the same laws, end quote, Gillette's human drift railed against competition, which he believed was, quote, the prolific source of ignorance in every form of crime, and that which increases the wealth of the, the, wealth of the few at the expense of the many, the present system of competition between individuals results in fraud, deception, and adulteration of almost every article we eat, drink, or wear, end quote. Competition resulted in, quote, a waste of material and labor beyond calculation, end quote. Competition was the source of, quote, selfishness, war, uh, uh, murder, robbery, lying, prostitution, forgery, divorce, deception, brutality, ignorance, injustice, drunkenness, insanity, suicide, and every other crime, which have their base in competition and ignorance. This explains the recent Gillette ad, after all. <laughs> the company has finally discovered that the root of competition, and thus of all evil, is toxic masculinity. So, give me another second here. But the corporate so socialist King Camp Gillette uh, may as well have patented this disposable safety razor <clears throat> to, to prevent so many desperate people from cutting their throats at least until they realized that the, ans the answer to all their problems, which he introduced in Human Drift, a singular monopoly, which would, quote, naturally control all production and distribution, specializing in everything, such that, quote, every article sold to consumer from the package to its contents will be the product of the United Company. Under the United Company, the production of necessary goods and eventually of everything would be consolidated and centralized, eliminating the wastes and hazards of the many and widely dispersed manufacturing plants and buildings of the current haphazard and chaotic system. Most cities and towns would be, quote, destroyed, as would all competitors, as the vast majority of the population would re relocate to the metropolis, where powered by Niagara Falls, all production would take place 
and everyone's lives would center around the corporation whose commercial and governmental power would be total. Lest anyone think that the human drift represented the lark of a young idealist before he came to his senses and founded a company with almost unparalleled name recognition, Gillette went on to publish The World Corporation in 1910, a prospectus for developing a worldwide singular monopoly. But founding his company and patenting his razor between writing these two treatises, Gillette's biographer Russell Adams quipped, it was almost as if Karl Marx had paused between the Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital to develop a dissolving toothbrush or collapsible comb. <laughs> a few passages from World Corporation should be sufficient to establish Gillette as the prototypical corporate socialist. Corporations will continue to form, absorb, expand, and grow, and no power of man can prevent it. Preventer, promoters of world corporation are the true socialists of this generation, the actual builders of the cooperative system, which is eliminating competition and in practical business, reaching results which socialists have vainly tried to attain through legislation and agitation for centuries. Uh, opposition to world corporation by, which, by individuals, by states, or by governments will be of no avail. Opposition in any case can only be a temporary effect. Barriers will only centralize power and cause increased momentum when they give way. The corporation will also dominate material, but also mental production, as Gillette praises the hive mind. World corporation represents individual intelligence and force combined, centralized and intelligently directed. Individuals are of the corporate mind, but not the corporate mind. And as if anticipating Google's secret mission statement, Gillette wrote, World Corporation will possess all knowledge of all men, and each individual mind will find complete expression through the great corporate mind. Finally, waxing poetic in Ray Kurzweil mode, Gillette wrote, World Corporation will have a life everlasting. Individual man will live his life and pass into the great beyond, but this great corporate mind will live on through the ages always absorbing and perfecting for the utilization and benefit of all the inhabitants of the earth. <clears throat> um, it is worth noting that Gillette's business practices were not wholly at odds with his ideas in his books. True to his monopolistic impulses, he regularly filed patents, and in 1917, <clears throat> with the outbreak of World War I, the company provided every soldier with a shaving kit paid for by the U.S. government. <clears throat> But Gillette's expressions of corporate socialism, did Gillette's expressions of corporate socialism actually help his business efforts or merely ease his guilty conscience or what? We can't be sure. But speculating about the objectives of today's corporate leftists may help make sense of the rhetoric of such corporate leftists of the past. <clears throat> Back to the contemporary woke capitalism. Today's corporate social justice rebranding represents at least a rhetorical overthrow of Milton Friedman's extremely narrow view of corporate responsibility. In, freedom, in Capitalism and Freedom, 1962, freedom, uh, Friedman declared that one and only one social responsibility of business is to increase profits. Friedman won the Nobel Prize in economics in 1976, and by the 1950s, uh, his notion of limited corporate social responsibility had become widely accepted. Yet woke capitalism could still satisfy Friedman's pro profit-only maxim. If all the world's a stage, then the corporate mouthing of social justice bromides may be play-acting and therefore mawkish parody. To be truly woke, woke, then, might mean that one is awake to the woke-acting corporations, the woke-believing consumers, and maybe even the demands of wokeness altogether. This explanation is consistent with the profit requirement and allows one to make short shrift of newly found corporate virtue. It is a cynical sham and proves uh, more than ever that the, sh uh, that the chicanery of corporations and their billionaire owners knows no bounds. This view is very similar to that, that held by uh, the critic of woke billionaires and author of Winner Take, Winners Take All. Now, as tempting as such post-truth cynicism may be, it doesn't explain the promotion of woke or leftist views 
by corporations and the effects that such promotions may have in making their consumer bases more leftist in the first place, a circumstance that they will have to deal with at some point. Arguably, corporations would not espouse and thereby potentially spread political views merely to assuage a consumer contingent unless said views aligned ultimately with their own interests. One is led to wonder what politics would but best serve the interests of corporate leftists, especially aspiring corporate socialists. To benefit corporate leftists, corporate socialists, or any other monolithic singular producer and governmentality, a political creed would likely place a heavy emphasis on equality. Such an emphasis would likely be accompanied by shaming of the privileged, along with demands that they surrender their advantages. All this takes place in Gillette's book. books. To emphasize equality, the creed benefiting the corporate leftists would recognize refugees, the different disenfranchised, and at least in theory would be internationalist rather than nationalist or nativist. While declaring equality, the political creed of the corporate leftists might, might nevertheless stress difference endlessly between identity groups and even between them, within them, and might benefit from the creation of utterly new identity types. Such a creed would consistently keep the identity groups concerned with whether or not they were losing ground to other identity groups rather than worrying about the corporate socialists. Watch words might include such things as equity, inclusion, and diversity. Always on the cutting edge, the corporate leftists would welcome the promotion of the new and disruption of the old, but always with improvement in mind. A political creed that aimed at dismantling traditional gender to the family, local customs, tradition, and even historical memory would remove the last bastions against state or major corporate power. Ultimately, the corporate leftist or corporate socialist would benefit from a singer, singular governmental monopoly with one set of rules. As Gillette noted, ideally, this global government would be the corporation itself. Thus, woke capitalism or corporate leftism does not consist of merely rhetorical placebos, symbolic over economic concessions, or even the mere placating of liberal political elites. Woke capitalism or corporate leftism actually represents the corporate interests of the would-be monopolists, the corporate socialists, and the corporate leftists in general. Thank you. How long did I go there? You have about 15 minutes. Really? Per perfect. Take questions. I'm, I'm told to look for the blue, the scary blue box. Where is it? <laughs> Get in the blue box. Thank you. In uh, the book, uh, The Most Dangerous Superstition by Larkin Rose, he equates uh, statism with uh, religion. And I'm kind of curious as to. Uh, if you look at the Inquisitions, the witch trials, you know, the, the Roman Inquisition, Spanish Inquisition, that was dealing with the her heresy of the Roman Catholic Church or the witch trials as far as basically mind control, as far as the dissidents. How do you see as far as this postmodernism, the new Inquisition with a secular state, and is there any connection historically or theoretically to the Inquisitions? Wow, that's a great question. Let me start off by saying why I chose this idea of libertarianism versus postmodernism. It's because on, on Tom Wood's show, he suggested that there was a contingent of libertarians who believed that postmodernism, because of its willy-nilly, anything-goes sort of uh, theoretical uh, whatever, is actually, <laughs> is actually compatible with... Uh, Libertarianism, and and I and that's why I, I I wanted to point out that it's very incompatible because whenever whenever there's no uh, objective correlative for knowledge, and whenever knowledge is basically asserted rather than demonstrated, you have the uh, the problem of it being enforced and you know used as a form of power. And it's, it's connected to, it's, it's an inquisition. I'd say right now it's a soft one. I, I call it, I think we're more, more or less in a soft cultural revolution. It's, it's more like it. 
uh, as in uh, China, 66 to 76. It's, we're in a soft cultural revolution. They haven't started uh, tearing pe- uh, professors or teachers out of the classroom and you know yet. Uh, well, yeah, they have, but <laughs> uh, I can't talk about that. Uh, but I mean, they haven't uh, physically brutalized them yet. Uh, I guess, although it's close. Uh, so I think we're in a, I, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to keep religion out of it because I just think it complicates it. It's uh, I think social justice represents a religious creed because. It is based on ritual and belief, with no, uh, uh, with it, without without knowledge. There's no knowledge base there. It's just religion. It's just a ritual and belief. They have a lot of rituals and they have beliefs and they enforce the, the beliefs with rituals generally. As, uh, but I, I don't know about an Inquisition because. Um, you, you you may not have people being torn out of classrooms. Violence. Physically, yeah. So basically, what you have is you have fear being used to control people because they know that their careers, and oh, yeah. jobs, and their social standing are then at risk. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you have a tremendous amount of uh, intimidation going on. Uh, you know, there's the there's the threat of force for sure. Uh, the woman who invited Charles Murray to speak got in the hospital, and there have been cases of uh, young American for Liberty kids being punched. So we're moving in that direction. You seem to have thought very carefully about this. Do you have any thoughts about how we can oppose it? Yeah. Actually, it goes back to uh, the first question. I think uh, social justice is, it has to be understood to be religious in character. And it's being taught in public schools. Okay, So that to me, it could be the, the separation clause could be applied. Uh, once we can show that it has a religious basis, we can oppose it on the basis of, it, of its dissemination as religion in public institutions. Um, that's, that's the best answer. I've, I, I, my, my historical work is in secularism, uh, which comes from the free thought movement of the 19th century, which is very akin to um, the free thinking uh, libertarian uh, classical liberal position. Uh, and th- th- that's, I think, the best way to deal with it is, is to treat it as try to get it across uh, that this is a religious movement that's not based on any evidence. It's ba- it's a creed. It's dogmatic. It's being forced on people. They must adopt it at at, at their own peril. Uh, things like that. You must be a social justice warrior, then. Uh, uh, <laughs> t- technical difficulties aside, uh, yes, it, I have a question. Uh, now, you draw the similarity between our modern identity politics and the Cultural Revolution in China, but I would say there is a major difference between what we have then and what we have now, in that in China there was one identity, as far as I understand, the Marxist. Here, if you look at identity politics, it's a uh, polytheistic religion. I, I am black, I am homosexual, and all this. Yeah. So would you say that this is a major uh, point into how it's being administered and its uh, prospects? No, no, no I, I, I would think that. The, see, the, the creed is, is, is what you have to adopt. It doesn't, if, if you sufficiently adopt the creed and given, depending on your identity status, where you are in the hierarchy, uh, appropriately uh, castigate yourself or, or otherwise, you know, um, self-flagellate, et cetera, et cetera, you're fine. So it doesn't, and it's ultimately about confession of the creed. So in that sense, it's very similar to the uh, cultural revolution. That, yes, there were, there were no differences in identity, but there actually, you know, quite frankly, there were. They were looking at people that held positions of authority and cultural traditional uh, values that were, they were the they were the holders of the of the cultural heritage. Those were the people that were attacked most vigorously and first. Well, uh, keeping the uh, parallel with the uh, cultural revolution, 
how 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 what do you think that means for uh, your argument for considering religion and excluding it from schools? Because no legal arguments would save you during the Cultural Revolution because it's the government establishing itself that that is imposing those those threats. And the same thing goes here. Uh, it, it's all government sanctioned. So, yeah. and and my point is. It is, it's not uh, an argument, as you said, it's a religious thing. And just like in the uh, Cultural Revolution, it was not a discussion, it was physical aggression. Yeah. So shouldn't physical aggression perhaps be met with physical resistance? Uh, the first part of your question, I think you're asking me, is it, uh, is it coercive to keep religion out of school? Is that the first question? No, no my question okay. is, why would the state, why would, we seek legal remedy for something mm. that is imposed by the state. In the oh, okay. Would do that. Well, I mean, it's it's a it's. I think this is something that's happening within public institutions, not with state state sanction, frankly. Uh, so, I mean, it's not like the senators are, are writing bills. Yeah, let's uh, let's indoctrinate them into this social justice business right away. Uh, you know, and passing these this legislation. This is this is fairly. Um, this is a, this is subliminal, almost. I mean, there, there's there's really serious indoctrination going on from kindergarten. I, K, I say K through PhD, really. <laughs> uh. Is there any evidence that corporations or corporate leaders are actively, directly financing some of these social justice organizations? If you could, um, you know, if you could find me that evidence, I would. Uh. <laughs> You have no idea how, how hard I'm looking for that, but I, actually there are there is some evidence, in particular at, at certain uh, high tech corporations, um, and I've, I'm I'm tapping into uh, the culture uh, of of uh, of these institutions and connecting it to their uh, to their politics as it's as it's disseminated through their technology. Actually, so I think it's there. It's a very tough argument to make, but somebody's got to do it. Uh, unfortunately, in Italy, uh, the indoctrination. Unfortunately, in Italy, this indoctrination uh, is not happening only in public institutions, but also in private oh, institutions. Absolutely. Private institutions, uh, uh, religious private institutions, not religious private institutions. So, right. yeah, this is happening anywhere. Agreed. Well, I agree, and that's why I say that if you're going to be a social justice university, that's fine. Just declare it. This is a social justice university. This is a Catholic university. This is a whatever. But just tell us what it is. Don't lie about it and hide this thing from us. Whatever we think of um, President Trump, uh, do you think that the uh, you know the attacks on him, which seem to be over the top, have anything to do with this? Uh, you know, the yeah. Social, I mean, the it's, SGWs. It's, yeah. I mean, he. I mean, he's tr he's triggered them. I mean, that's basically is Trump is 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 either. I think he's probably purposefully doing it. Uh, it should trigger them in order to get this reaction because he knows exactly what the trigger points are, and he's saying the op, you know, the absolutely improper uh, thing, uh, almost in every circumstance. It seems to me purposefully, unless he's like got political Tourette syndrome or something. <laughs> well, that may be the case. <laughs> so you've talked about uh, intersectionality as being a kind of attempt to reorder and that if you are on, if you are at a certain order and you do the correct amount of self-flagellation, you'll be okay. Yeah. But it seems to me that if you are deemed the wrong kind of person, no amount of self-flagellation will save you. And so I'm wondering if instead of an attempt at reordering, it makes more sense to think of intersectionality as a mechanism by which anyone can be deemed guilty. Oh, yes, I think that's right. I think the creed comes first, and and violating the creed is really what will... It, it, even, even, strangely enough, especially if you are of a, a particular identity that is supposed to have certain beliefs based on your identity, it is enforced with even greater rigor and, uh, and, and um, uh, intensity. Like uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're 
Well, I, I don't want—I don't want to really use him as an example because this is his thing. But you know, Milo Yiannopoulos is gay, and he's—he's he's married to a black man, and he, he does everything that he believes everything he's not supposed to. Things like that is a, a person that would get punished, but he's gotten punished for other things. Thomas too, right? I mean, that's yes, sort of the Clarence beginning. Thomas. That's right. Yeah. That's correct. Very recently. Dad was, you know, if she, you know, and, and would have been, you know, able to say, hey, I'm Martina Navratilova. I don't take this crap from you. But, you know, it, it's like everybody gets gets laid low. I mean, it, there, there's nobody willing to stand up to it. Yeah, I mean, the, the only good thing is the left eats its own, uh, but not fast enough. Uh, <laughs> I think on that note, we'll end. <laughs>